Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. I am delighted that you're curious in this material, and I'm really honored to be the person to share it with you. So um, just a, a quick introduction. My name is Jane O'Neill. I own a company called Culturally Curious, and I present art appreciation programs like this, uh, mostly virtually these days. But my background is in art history and in education. I have a master's degree in both, and I've worked at a number of New England art museums and taught art history at the college level for about a decade or so. So talking about art and art history and, and and putting together a program like this is really just my passion and and I thoroughly enjoy doing this so I I love that um, that you joined us for this program this morning so this morning's program is uh, is on a, a, a topic that is probably relatable to almost everybody on some level this idea of frenemies uh, the term was coined back in the 1950s and it essentially refers to somebody that you like and you spend time with but somebody who also antagonizes you a little bit uh, maybe somebody that you're competitive with and of course competition uh, fuels innovation. We see that in the business world. We see it, you know, Microsoft versus Apple or Pepsi versus Coke in terms of their marketing. So it's always interesting to see what a little bit of antagonism can do in your life and in your career. So today we're going to be looking at three major rivalries in the art world. I would say probably three of the greatest rivalries, artists that were working closely together and um, and sort of fueled by that sense of competition with it, with their rival. So we have images on the screen right now that we'll be looking at a little bit more in depth uh, during the course of the program, uh, images from Matisse and Picasso. But let me just give you the lay of the land and how we'll move through the material today. There's basically three sections. We'll be looking at Italian Renaissance rivals, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. And for each of these sections, what I'll do is give a little introduction to each each of these artists and, and um, help you feel a little bit more familiar with them because without any context, the rivalry I think can, can sort of come across as a little flat or meaningless. So you'll get an introduction to both of these artists and, and sort of a, an understanding in terms of what makes their work interesting, special, or valuable to us as, as, a, as a culture. So we'll move from the Italian Renaissance up to 19th century, 19th century England, and we'll be looking at two rivals in romantic landscape painting, and that is um, John Constable and J.M.W. Turner. And then we will finish up with the, our titans of the 20th century, and that is Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso. The, that's the matchup of modern masters. So there's a lot to look at, a lot to consider. I'm going to dive right in, and this will be about an hour of content. And then I, I, um, I encourage and welcome you to type in any questions or comments that you have in the chat along the way. But we'll stop and look at those questions and comments at the end of the program, where we'll welcome anybody to uh, uh, talk or, or type in questions or, um, or, or commentary at that point too. All right, so let's dive into our Italian Renaissance rivals. So here they are right here. We have Leonardo da Vinci on the left in a self-portrait from later in his life. And then this is a portrait of Michelangelo when he was about uh, 69 years old. And this was painted by another Italian Renaissance artist named Da Volterra. Now, one important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about these two titans of the Italian Renaissance is that there's about a 23 year age difference between da Vinci and Michelangelo. Michelangelo was sort of the young upstart and da Vinci was the trailblazer. He was the artist who sort of ushered in the high Renaissance, you know, this interest in humanism and empirical thinking and, um, and creating the illusion of perspective in a work of art. So uh, so you can imagine that after he's uh, sort of established himself and he becomes the celebrated artist, it's a little bit threatening to have this young, really talented young man come on the scene. So let's get started with an introduction so that we have a fuller understanding of who Leonardo da Vinci was. And the image over here on the left of the screen is one of the only confirmed portraits of Leonardo da Vinci during his lifetime. So you can see from the image that he was actually a, quite a handsome 
a man. And he was actually openly gay. He was very eccentric, particularly in terms of his dress, but he was sort of seen as this like national treasure. People really loved him. So he could kind of get away with anything. And like I mentioned, he's the founder of the high Renaissance. He ushers in these, these great ideals that are associated with it. And he was, um, to say he was multi-talented is like an understatement. He was, um, he was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, um, and he's interested in uh, anatomy, astronomy, paleontology, all these things are documented in his really extensive notebooks. And we'll be looking at those notebooks in just a moment, but I think it's also really important to, to frame the idea that he had this endlessly curious and inventive mind. In these notebooks, he's asking questions on a daily basis, things like, why is the sky blue? What does the inside of a woodpecker's mouth look like? Um, so he was just constantly questioning the world in um, a really wonderful way that led to really innovative thinking. Now we think of him and his masterworks as being primarily a painter, but there's only about 25 paintings that are attributed definitively to him. And many of them are unfinished. So even though he's our Renaissance master here, there's not much work to his credit beyond these, these uh, notebooks and a few unfinished paintings. But the works that we do have are remarkable. So the images that I have on the screen here on the left is um, what's known as the Vitruvian Man from about 1490. And, um, and here we see some of those Renaissance ideals sort of hatching in a drawing like this, where you can see he's kind of working through the ideal proportions of man and relating them to perfect geometries. And these are, these are just concepts that really um, become sort of uh, crystallized in the high Renaissance. So he's, he's like the early innovator here. And and then over on the right, these are pages from his, um, his notebooks. At the top, we see a plan or a design for a flying machine. And at the bottom, a lot of people think of this as like an early invention of a helicopter. Um, it's referred to as being an aerial screw. Now, as you look closely at these pages, you'll notice that he was actually writing backwards in his notebook, a mirror reflection of, of the text. So you could really only read this if you hold it up to a mirror. Can you imagine creating 7,000 pages of notebook sketches and, and um and, and prose where you're writing backwards like this. So he's considered so innovative that um, actually uh, billionaire Bill Gates actually spent about $30 million on a 70 page uh, collection of Leonardo da Vinci's writings and drawings. That's how valued these pages are. Now, I mentioned before, he's primarily thought of as a painter and his paintings, even though they're few and far between, are incredibly influential and iconic in our culture. So one of them is The Last Supper, which uh, dates to about uh, 1495, roughly. And this was uh, sort of a variation on the fresco technique, which is when you paint in wet plaster on a wall and it becomes part of the wall as it dries. He was innovating here too, in terms of his process, but he painted this this picture uh, on the wall of a dining room um, inside a monastery. So as the monks were sitting there eating silently, they're seeing this incredible drama unfold on the wall. And Leonardo da Vinci had a really innovative approach to how to paint this, this picture, this story that had been around for roughly 1500 years. So he paints the moment where Jesus says to his apostles, one of you is going to betray me. And then so there's this ripple of drama um, spreading out on either side of this cool, calm, collected Jesus at the center. So, um, so da Vinci innovates here by sort of grouping each of, these, um, each of these apostles into a little cluster of three so our eyes and our minds can kind of digest how each of these figures is responding to this horrible news. His other innovation here is using this uh, uh, the illusion of three-dimensional perspective here. So the um, 
the architectural lines converge um, at the center at Jesus's head, drawing our attention to and reinforcing what is most important in the scene. This is the most reproduced image in the world. That's how influential Leonardo da Vinci is. But just keeping in mind our time and the other artists we have to visit today, one other work by Leonardo da Vinci, which we all know is 1503's uh, Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world. And, um, and it's it's famous for a, a variety of reasons, but what I want to emphasize to you here is the innovation that Leonardo da Vinci introduces with this picture. And it's sort of a smoky, fuzzy form of shadowing, of shading a face and providing that, um, that illusion of, of a three-dimensional surface on a, on a two-dimensional canvas. So her face looks um, sculptural. It really does look three-dimensional as do her hands. And it's because of this soft, smoky way he shaded her face. He actually dissected a mouth before and was very familiar with the muscles around the mouth. And neuroscientists have studied the way the human eye perceives this face. And at first glance, the human eye perceives her smile to be broader than it actually is because of that very subtle shading here. And then of course you study it a little bit more carefully and it's just, you know, just the, the little hint, the little peak of a smile here. Um, there's a lot going on with this picture, but I, it has, um, I think it's sort of captured the public, uh, public's imagination because he held on to it for so long. This was a commissioned portrait, but he kept it with him for roughly the next 15 years or so. So we always imagine his attachment to it meant that it's um, maybe more significant than just a simple portrait. So let's turn our attention to da Vinci's rival, Michelangelo, um, an artist who doesn't really need an introduction either, but we uh, keep in mind, he's about a generation younger. He could be da Vinci's son. He's that much younger. Now, um, Michelangelo, sort of um, his career begins when he's in his early 20s. And this coincides with right, right around that year of 1500, which is when we imagine kind of the high Renaissance um, happening. Um, all, of, all of the great work of, of the high Renaissance kind of uh, kicks into gear right around that time. And you have uh, biographers who are interested in Michelangelo and his work and his life. So people are documenting him as his career is progressing. And he's referred to as a Renaissance man who's um, supreme in all three uh, uh, categories of the arts, that is painting, sculpture, and architecture. So as, as da Vinci was sort of great in all these, all these variety of, of um, interests, you have Michelangelo who is the best at sort of the top three. Now, Leonardo was really affable. He got along with people. He was sort of considered this national treasure. And you have uh, Michelangelo as sort of our quintessential artist, the archetype of like the moody, isolated, doesn't really work well with others type of artist who, um, who just uh, in general is, is really um, reclusive. So on top of that, you have da Vinci who's well-dressed and he's out and about. Michelangelo rarely bathed and he rarely uh, changed his clothes. They actually had to cut his clothes off of him um, after he died because he would work and sleep in the same clothes um, for extended periods of time, even though he was a very wealthy man at that point. So uh, da Vinci uh, innovated and created inventions in his notebooks. We have Michelangelo who was writing poetry in his. So a lot of parallels parallels there, but a lot of differences too. And very quickly, Michelangelo's greatest work, some of his greatest works that we're familiar with are, um, he, well, he begins as a sculptor, so they are in stone. This is his uh, marble carving of the dead Christ in his mother's arms. This type of sculpture is called a pieta. He created this before the age of 25, for the Vatican. And if you go there today, you can still see it. It's behind bulletproof glass because it has been attacked in the past. But what Michelangelo has introduced here is this concept um, that the Pieta and other works that are about Jesus and his life um, don't have to emphasize Jesus's suffering per se, which had been sort of the focus in the Middle Ages. Instead, Michelangelo introduces the concept that in order to show Christ's divinity, you focus on his um, perfect 
uh, beauty. And you see that with the body and the face of Jesus and even the face of his mother. This is supposed to be the mother of a 33 year old man and she doesn't look a day over 25 herself. So, um, so we see the perfection of their proportions and the beauty of their faces speak to their divinity. Um, so, uh, so he accomplishes this at a young age in Rome and then he is called to Florence to create a sculpture of um, David from the biblical story of David and Goliath, David being the young shepherd boy who can take down a giant with a slingshot and a single stone. David is like the mascot of Florence that sort of sees themselves as, you know, the young upstart to Rome, which is Goliath. So he, he um, there were actually already sculptures of David that were created for the city of Florence. And they oftentimes stayed very true to the, um, to the story itself, which is David is a very young boy. Um, and so, uh, so Michelangelo's innovation here is that he instead carves a superhero, a fully grown man with perfect idealized anatomy here. And, um, and, and the anatomy and the pose are really inspired by the classical past. Michelangelo was essentially given this large piece of Carrera marble in order to work on. It was considered a flawed piece of marble that had been sitting around the city and from it, he carves this 17 foot tall uh, depiction of David that uh, is, it just, it personifies a hero, a hero that's, that's about to spring into action. There's so much potential here because of the strength of this form in particular. So, um, so clearly, by this time, Michelangelo's not even 30 years old, but he has proven himself as a sculptor. The last work I wanted to briefly introduce you to for Michelangelo is, of course, the Sistine Chapel ceiling, um, which he was called back to Rome in order to, to do just a few years later. And he did not consider himself a painter. He was very frustrated with this commission. But when he was done, after four years, he had created the world's largest fresco. And it is still one of the most celebrated works in Western art today. This is just one of the most famous sections, the creation of Adam, where we see Michelangelo's interest in the male nude once again, this kind of perfectly formed, almost a sculpted version of Adam sort of languishing on this little patch of land. And we can see that he hasn't yet been fully formed. His body exists, but perhaps not his mind or his soul. So we have this um, it, very sort of uh, Zeus inspired depiction of God the Father, who is rarely depicted in art, kind of swooping in with all of this billowing drapery and all of these little cherubs or pudi surrounding him. And he is all strength and vigor. And so his arm extends out to Adam's kind of um, languishing hand over here. And there's about an inch of space between those fingers. And we know that the second they connect, Adam will be uh, a, a fully formed human being with a spirit, with a soul, with a mind and with free will. So there's all that potential in that little inch of space. And of course, um, all this interest in, um, in the human form and beauty and divinity in this picture. So let's get back to our rivalry here. We've got Michelangelo and Leonardo, and I should mention that Leonardo da Vinci does not like Michelangelo. And this is sort of well known, it's documented. And, um, and it's at this point in around 1503, so uh, da Vinci has just created the Mona Lisa, Michelangelo has just created the David, the city of Florence essentially creates this competition for them. If you've been to Florence before, you've probably seen this building in, in one of the main squares. It's called the Palazzo Vecchio. And it's essentially like the town hall. There's actually a reproduction of Michelangelo's David just outside today. So inside the town hall, there's a council meeting room. And the intention was to fill the walls, cover the walls with, um, with images that speak to Flor Florence's past. And this was right after Florence became a republic. So there's a real interest in creating patriotic images about the city of Florence. Um, many of the artists that were um, contracted at this time were um, interested in images of war and battle scenes. So that's, um, what, that's how my 
Michelangelo and da Vinci approached this topic and, and this challenge, but they were going to be placed right next to each other. So it's sort of both of these artists going toe to toe. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what they created for this, for this competition, for this challenge you're in good company because the, the works themselves don't actually survive, but we do have copies of the cartoons, the large scale drawings that they did in preparation. Now, da Vinci sort of got off track with this project. He started it about a year earlier than Michelangelo, and we can see his, um, his composition over here on the right. Uh, he got off track in the sense that he's just like the Last Supper, he's kind of innovating in terms of how he's gonna create the fresco. He's mixing in different materials, including wax. And then he starts to design essentially like an elevator to get up and down the wall. So you can see he's not that concerned with creating the image or he got really sidetracked very quickly. But let's look at this image um, or at least the, the reproduction of, of, um, of what he created that exists today. So it's a battle scene between um, Florence and Pisa. And we see uh, four men on horseback who are all kind of ferociously fighting Look at these horses, they're even attacking each other. And then there's three people who are underfoot here who are kind of suffering from this attack. You see that same sort of um, fuzzy shading in this image that you see with the Mona Lisa's face. Look at the way he's describing even the horse's bodies here. Um, there's, um, there's that real subtlety to suggest a three-dimensional form. And, um, and even though that there's chaos in this picture, I do love that there's a little bit of a sense of balance in the way that these arms kind of arc up and the swords cross. And then we come down to those horses' face. It almost creates a nice little heart right at the center of the composition here. So, um, so then we have Michelangelo who starts about a year later and the, the battle scene that he chooses to depict is one where the Florentine army was bathing and then they're sort of surprised by an enemy and they're all getting out of the water to go fight. So Michelangelo has chosen the perfect subject for himself because he loves to depict the male nude. And when you look at this, this is um, a student's sort of copy of, of his cartoon, which no longer exists. Uh, you can see that the interest here is purely in male anatomy and also that there's a crispness to each of these figures. It's almost as though he's depicting a sculpture in with each of these figures. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that Michelangelo is so sort of obsessed with uh, muscles and male anatomy that he's inventing muscles that don't even exist on a lot of these figures. Uh, you know, I always think if he were alive today, I think he'd be subscribing to like bodybuilding magazines, or maybe he'd be really into like WWF wrestling. He just really loved um, uh, men's muscles here. So um, so shortly after Da Vinci flees this project, um, and here's just a, 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 a close up of, of that work of art. So we can see all of these different figures and get a sense in terms of the variety of poses here too. It's sort of foreshadowing what he's going to do at, um, at the Sistine Chapel. So we have, Da Vinci, who, um, who, as I mentioned, um, sort of was innovating in terms of his materials using wax in, in, as part of the fresco process. Well, unfortunately for him, his painting wasn't drying quickly enough. So he brought in some big torches to help it dry. Well, that caused the, the wax to melt. So his picture in part started to melt down the wall. And then he just decided to abandon the whole thing. <laughs> and shortly after that, Michelangelo walked away from, from the project as well. So these unfinished works actually stayed on the wall inside the Palazzo Vecchio for about a decade and you have almost a generation of young artists who came in to study from it. We know that, um, that, that, that those walls were painted over and we suspect that somebody put um, a new wall over Leonardo's picture. So there's been all of this research done to try and find just where in that council chamber um, uh, uh, da Vinci's sort of lost masterwork might still be hidden. So in this matchup, I would say even though he abandoned this work early and fled sort of at the notion that his rival might be working right alongside him. I'm going to give this one 
to Leonardo da Vinci, because in our culture today, we, I think we know him and sort of respect his work in a way that Michelangelo uh, doesn't get the same kind of respect. And just to sort of summarize that really quickly, we all have heard of the Da Vinci Code. We probably all have read it too, um, sold 80 million copies, and it brought about sort of a new cultural understanding of who Leonardo da Vinci was, or at least an appreciation for him. We also have on the right over here, an image called Salvador Monday, which um, is sort of a contested uh, Leonardo da Vinci painting. It's been heavily restored. So even today, it's like how much of it is actually Leonardo da Vinci's hand. But in 2017, it sold for $450 million, the most expensive painting ever sold. It, it went to um, a Saudi prince. And so we have this notion that that um, Leonardo da Vinci's work and his mind is so highly prized in our culture today. I think he stands out as the winner in this rivalry at least. So let's turn our attention and speed up through time to the 19th century. And we're going to land in England and look at two major adversaries. And that is um, John Constable who we see on the left and, um, and J.M.W. Turner who we see in a, in a self portrait on the right. Now these two artists were exact peers. They were born a year apart from each other. And you probably have had the experience of going to school with someone who was sort of right at your level and who maybe, um, who maybe inspired you to work a little bit harder because you wanted to, to outshine them in some ways. And that is in so many ways what was happening between Constable and Turner, but their careers were dramatically different. Let's start off with Constable on the left. And here's another depiction depiction of him here. Uh, and we have his dates up here on the screen. Now, John Constable is the son of a well-to-do miller. He, can, he has these middle class or even upper middle class roots, and he lives a very traditional life. He gets married. He's passionately in love with his wife. She predeceases him, and he actually wears black for the rest of his life. That's how passionate he is about her, and they have seven children. Sort of like Leonardo da Vinci, he's well-dressed, he's affable, people like him, he can get along with others. But um, his, his body of work, his, his collection of paintings is really well known for just being based on and inspired by the region where he grew up. Um, you can imagine it's almost like if somebody gave you a brand new camera or a drone or something like that, and you only took pictures of your house and your garden. He wasn't really um, interested in exploring beyond that, but he was able to capture um, these, these scenes of, of tranquility, of beauty, and believe it or not, he did it in what was considered a radical way at the time. We'll be exploring that. Now, at the time in England, you have the Royal Academy of Art, which has elevated the status of art and artists um, in general, but it, it's the organization that sort of um, decides and chooses who is good and who isn't. It makes or breaks careers. And, um, and for John Constable, he moves very slowly up the ranks at the Royal Academy. I think it took over a decade for him to finish his studies there. So let's take a look at John Constable's work sort of quickly. This is um, his painting called The Veil of Dedham from 1802. This is in the National Gallery in Scotland. And um, and this is a very typical constable painting, other than the fact that it's oriented vertically. Most of his landscapes are, hor are horizontally oriented. So what we see here uh, is a beautiful depiction of, of nature. Believe it or not, this was considered like an, uh, an industrialized landscape at the time, because you can see a working mill here at the center of the composition. There's even a little bridge, a suggestion of a city. We see the tower of the, of the Dedham Cathedral in the middle ground there just breaking that horizon line. Constable had sort of sketched out this same scene about 30 years earlier. And, um, and in his earlier sketch, uh, th there were um, little, there weren't these little tiny sapling branches coming out, out of this blasted tree. There wasn't the sense of industry happening in the landscape. And so he's sort of documenting um, not just nature here, 
but, um, but politics, religion, um, and he's really trying to elevate the status of landscape painting along the way. Um, it's not just about the land, it's about the people and the animals and everything that impacts it. He's also included in this version of this work of art, a depiction of a gypsy woman in the foreground who is nursing her child. And she just, she's that little uh, bright red accent in this picture that sort of draws your eye in and provides this nice sort of rest away from all of this green. And she even, her presence there sort of speaks to how this landscape is changing and who is, um, who's even working this landscape. Now let's move on to another uh, constable picture. This one is from 1819 and it's in the collection of the Frick Museum. It's called The White Horse. Now um, this is sort of the start of what are called constables six footers. These are very large sort of monumental landscape paintings that just capture all of this, this familiar landscape to him um, in minute detail. These paintings were considered radical for the time because they were so green. Uh, actually, uh, our artists, landscape artists would use a lot of brown in their paintings to make it look like the varnished old masterworks. And so here there's an immediacy and a freshness to this picture that was actually startling to his contemporaries. And of course we get a nice little break again with some little dabs of red over here as the horse is ferried from one shore to the next. So a lovely painting uh, painted on a grand scale. I should mention that um, that this area where he grew up, uh, Suffolk, Essex in England is now referred to as Constable Country and people take tours that are just, you know, focused on these special locations that he painted. The last constable painting I wanted to share with you is probably his most famous. It's called the Hay Wain from 1821. Uh, let's start with the sky here. Constable is famous for his studies of the clouds and the sky. And he had this way to create this sort of shimmering effect of light in a lot of his pictures. And so he was really concerned about, you know, momentary effects of light and shadow, time of day. This is sort of like a nice precursor to the French Impressionists who would only come around decades and decades later. The subject matter here is um, this hay cart that's being driven through this little shallow body of water sort of to cool off the horses in, in the um, noonday sun. This cottage over here still exists. It's, um, it was a tenant farmer who um, worked uh, John Constable's father's land. And, um, and so this is another picture that's not just about landscape, it's about the work on the land. I'm gonna zoom in over here and show you a few people working in the background. This is another hay cart over here and people at work. Um, here's another detail we're gonna zoom in on this tree over here just to show you that there was a real sketchiness and a real immediacy to the way he painted. This would have been um, uh, seriously considered radical for the time period. This would have looked unfinished to um, a lot of people who were alive at the time. One last kind of wonderful innovation in the way that he painted. Look at how he scraped this blue color across the surface of the water um, in order to achieve that kind of shimmering effect from the, the surface here. Uh, this was something that nobody else was really doing in their paintings, but it provides um, such a great effect as you're looking at it. So, um, so we have this idea that he's, he's doing sort of radical things with his pictures, although they look pretty traditional to our modern eye. So let's turn our attention to his rival, J.M.W. Turner. Now, he could not be more different. He was born within a year of Constable, but sort of like Michelangelo and Leonardo, their dispositions were entirely opposite. He came from a lower middle class background and he work, worked and really fought his way up through the ranks of the Royal Academy um, by being a prodigy at a very young age, but he worked hard for it. He finished his schooling very early on, and then he became a professor at the Royal Academy and sometimes even stood in um, as, as the, the president of the organization when needed. So, uh, so he, he found sort of a quick and immediate success that way. In terms of his personality, he was not as well liked as Constable, did 
did not get along as well with others as Constable. He was famously ugly, apparently, although I, I wouldn't say that based on this portrait of him. He was a confirmed bachelor in that he actually spoke out publicly against marriage. Most people think that he was just trying to give Constable a little dig here, but he was, um, it, he fathered at least uh, two children um, with at least one woman. Uh, he, like Michelangelo, was reclusive and, and would rather be alone than be with other people. And unlike Constable, he traveled around Europe and um, the bulk of, his, well, a lot of his pictures are inspired by his imagination. They're, they're incredibly turbulent, they're incredibly dramatic. They couldn't be further away from Essex and Suffolk. So let's take a look at some of these very expressive landscapes that, that Turner created. Now this is like a world away from the Hayway right here. This is um, Snowstorm Hannibal and his army crossing the Alps from 1812. So this is like a history picture and a landscape picture in one. So, Han so it's a story from, from you know, classical antiquity about Hannibal and his army. This is probably Hannibal down here riding an elephant in the lower right hand corner. Um, these are sort of incidental tribes people in the, in the foreground and then then the real star of this show is this incredible black cloud that's folding over itself and about to dump all of this snow over this army as they go through this mountain pass. Uh, we have the sun that sort of punctuates it, looks like it's about to be blotted out. And then this little patch of blue sky up here in the left-hand corner. This is as dramatic as landscape painting can get. This is a world away from John Constable, of course. Um, another incredible JMW Turner painting um, is right here in the Boston area. And this is at the MFA in Boston. This is called The Slave Ship from 1840. And it's not just a landscape painting, of course, it's sort of a commentary on the slave trade, because what we see here is a slave, uh, a slave ship that has thrown um, living people, um, uh, captured slaves overboard um, as they're heading into this uh, horrific typhoon uh, in order to, um, to, to be able to claim in the, the insurance on, on these people. So uh, we see hands and feet thrashing in the middle of the ocean, a lot of them still chained. We see these feeding frenzies of, of, of fish and these kind of monstrous looking sharks. But again, the sky here is so um, otherworldly and dramatic with the yellows and oranges and the sort of fuchsias and maroons over here. We can only imagine what this storm is going to do to this boat and to the poor souls still alive in the water. Um, and then the last constable that I wanted to share with you is called um, Rain, Steam, and Speed, the Great Western Railway. It's from 1844. It's in the National Gallery in London. And so this is a picture that's all about movement. And you get this feeling that this, that this steam train is going to barrel off of the canvas and sort of straight out at you. This is a picture that, um, that with careful viewing and a, and a good high resolution image really sort of pays off because you start to see these details like the fact that this is an uncovered train. You can actually see people's heads and faces in the back here. There's, and if you get a really good high resolution image, there's actually a rabbit somewhere in here that's darting across the track. So it's like this notion of man versus nature. There's a whole um, sort of town in the background, but most of the, most of it is sort of obliterated by the rain here. So, um, so we've got this energy, this, uh, and this sense of, of dynamism and movement in this picture that's really modern and, and really unlike these kind of tranquil scenes that Constable was painting. So let's talk about their rivalry and how this all comes together. We have the, the handsome and sort of plotting, at least in terms of his career, artist uh, Constable over here who stuck to his hometown. And then we have the, the really ambitious Turner who doesn't get along well with others, but has this incredibly imaginative brain. So how does that come to a head? Well, the Royal Academy 
had an annual summer exhibition at a place called Somerset House. And this is a different artist rendering of what uh, those exhibitions look like. You can see it's just painting chalk block. They are all right next to each other and everybody's sort of vying for attention. One year for the annual exhibition, uh, John Constable was on the, the team of people that were hanging the works of art, and he actually swapped out, con uh, he swapped out his rival Turner's work from a really nice um, uh, place for display, and he put his own work there instead. So that really agitated their relationship. The following year, the two artists, uh, their works for the summer exhibition were placed side by side. And these are those works. This is Constable on the left and Turner on the right. Now, leading up to the exhibition, there were a couple of days that are referred to as varnishing days, where the artists, having just traveled with their work, um, have the opportunity to go in and do a little touch-ups. They can varnish their work. They can make little adjustments as needed. And so Constable's in there, and he's got this um, really sort of complex composition happening here. It's the bridge at Waterloo. We can see all of these boats, all of these individuals. This is a really ambitious picture for him. And then we have a rather surreal green seascape from Turner. And Turner wasn't really spending a lot of time varnishing or touching up his work. But on the final day of, of varnishing, he walks in, walks in beside Constable who's busy at work, and he literally just takes out some red paint and sort of throws it at the canvas and then walks away. Everybody's like astonished by what he's done. And they're they're confounded by it. And it's only in the last hour or so that he has access to come in and touch up his work that he returns and works that red paint into the red buoy that we see here in the water. And with that, he's created this really nice balanced composition with that visual interest right there, that relief from the from the grays and the blues. And and it's um it, in contrast, you have Constable's picture, which seems fussy. It seems overdone. This is like Apple versus Microsoft here in terms of, of, um, of design work. And so Constable knew that he had been bested. He actually wrote to his family. He said, Turner has come in and he has fired a shot. He knew that he was done for with this, uh, with this particular move by his rival. Now, in the end, who wins out in this rivalry? Well, it was about 10 or 15 years ago that the British British people were surveyed on what was their favorite painting of, um, of Britain. And Turner and Constable ranked in the top two. And these were the top two pictures that were that were um, that were cited in in this poll. And I'm going to leave it to you. Who, who would you choose? Well, the British public chose Turner. They really liked this picture of an old warship that is um, being uh, uh, taken along by a tugboat to be, go be taken off for parts. And again, it's a really modern looking picture. The, it's got an ethereal quality that reminds me of like Monet at the beginning of Impressionism. The British people still liked the Hay Wayne, but it came in second. And, and I think as time goes along, we forget that the constable was still really radical and innovative for his time. These look like, you know, nostalgic scenes of the past in comparison to Turner. So Turner definitely wins out in this rivalry here. So let's finish up for the day with our modern uh, matchup here. And that is, of course, Henri Matisse, who we see the Frenchman on the left, and um, Pablo Picasso of Spain on the right. So, uh, so we, uh, we know these artists probably a little bit better than the other artists that we've seen so far today because their works are more a part of our lives. We see them more often. And because of that, we've also been a little bit desensitized to how radical their works of art were, particularly um, just after the turn of the century. Uh, both of these artists were really competing for this notion of like, what should modern art look like? Um, it hadn't been defined really. And so they're both, uh, um, they're both pushing themselves and they're pushing each other to try and find a solution to that answer because they had everybody had the sense that that things were changing and that the art had to change along with it. 
Now, Matisse described their relationship, this rivalry that they had. At one point, he described it as being like a boxing match. So we'll see sort of who gets in a hit and um, who takes a hit and who comes out um, if there's any knockouts in the end. So let's get a little bit more uh, acquainted with Henri Matisse. This is a rare image of him smiling. He seems like a very serious man when you go through the photographs. Um, but he came to art uh, sort of incidentally. He had been studying and preparing to be a lawyer and he started to take some drawing classes as a relief and then he um, he decided to abandon law altogether much to his parents chagrin um, and, and just focus on the arts he described painting as being like um, an oasis for him other than that he had a very sort of um, traditional life he was married he had children um, and, and, and he worked as a professional painter. Now he was very innovative, particularly just around the turn of the century. He was one of the leaders of a movement called Fauvism. And we'll take a look at what that really meant in terms of, um, of painting with an example coming up. But he, is, uh, he, he essentially decides that modern painting is going to be sort of determined by the use of color and the expressive use of color. Colors are so connected to our emotions and that's sort of what he was driving at. Like when we think of somebody being sad, we call them blue, somebody's green with envy. He wanted to sort of um, employ or deploy the, these colors in a really strategic way to create works that spoke to the modern experience. So he was very disciplined in his artwork. And, um, and so we'll see that there's a, a real sense of, of rigor, uh, particularly as he moves on in his career. One of the only things we'll see um, um, that he shares with Picasso is that he really considered Cezanne to be like the father or, or the master that he looked back to and found inspiration from. All right, so let's take a look at a few works by Matisse to get a better sense in terms of what he was trying to achieve with his artwork. This is his painting called Woman with a Hat from 1905. It's in the collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And, um, and even though this doesn't look sort of wildly innovative to our modern eye, I can't emphasize enough how different this was from everything that came before it when it was first exhibited. Um, there's a, 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 an American expatriate family called the Steins, Leo Stein and Gertrude Stein, who, um, who lived in Paris and they would go on to really sort of nurture all of these innovative modern artists. But even when they saw this work, Leo Stein referred to this as the nastiest, nastiest smear of paint he had ever seen. This sort of helped to coin that term, the Fauvis, because work like this was exhibited in a gallery uh, that also contained sort of very traditional works of art. And so these were called the beasts among the Donatellos. Um, and the wild beast translates to the Fauves. That's the, the wild color here, uh, red, like a wild beast, which is kind of amazing. Matisse's co-founder of this movement, Andre Durain, said that they were deploying color like sticks of dynamite. The critics asked Matisse, what was the, what color was this woman actually wearing? And he replied, um, black, of course. So he's being very playful with color here. He's um, using visible brush strokes here. He's not trying to create the illusion of a window onto another world. And then look at her face. He's lined her nose with lime green paint and put another stripe of it across her forehead. This was just considered wild for the time. And then, and, and she's dressed, you know, as an upper middle class woman with this really elaborate hat and the fan stretching out over her chest here. So this just did not not aligned with the way people thought that um, portraiture of, of upper class people should look. So he's ruffling feathers from the get go, but he did not come to this solution easily. Just a few years before he was actually taking knives to his canvases. He was so frustrated with um, trying to find the solution for modernism. And he, he himself didn't even really like where he was going with it sometimes. And within the space of a year or so, he, he creates this work, which is now known as probably his greatest masterwork. Um, this is called 
called Le Bonheur de Vivre. It's like the joy of life. And, um, and I think that this is such a, a beautiful painting and it's so easy to appreciate it with our modern eyes. Um, but at the time people were um, set off by what we're seeing here. Uh, it's a really traditional subject matter. It's like a pastoral setting, an Arcadian setting here. But when people looked at it because of the color, they um, they they like revolt. They were revolted. Matisse's dealer said it was greeted with an uproar of jeers, angry babble, and screaming laughter. People couldn't believe what he had done here. So in addition to you know painting bodies. Um, orange and purple, he's also used this really abrupt transition in perspective. So we have this ring of six figures uh, dancing in this middle ground here. And it's it becomes this composition that fascinates Matisse for um, for decades afterwards. He he keeps recreating this, this uh, circle of dancers in the background. So uh, even though people couldn't really handle the way he painted it when he first painted it within the space of about 15 years or so, it, it was uh, considered his masterwork. But even other artists at the time said that this was a disgrace. People talked about this being like the end of French painting in general. So Matisse goes on, just one last Matisse work to give you some context for who he was and what he was painting. He goes on to create images like this one. This is called Harmony in Red. It's from 1908. It's in the Hermitage Museum. And the red can be very overwhelming when you look at this. But, uh, but right off the bat, he's telling us that he's an artist who's really only interested in color. He's not trying to create the illusion on, of, of a window into another world here. Uh, this painting is decidedly flat. We've got a tabletop here that essentially looks as flat as the wall behind it. But it, 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 there are you know nice little pieces of fruit and a floral still life here. Uh, a very sort of calm, serene woman framing it, framing out the composition on the right. He gives us a little bit of relief from all the red with this um, landscape in the background. Uh, I think it could probably be alternately read as uh, a picture or a window it, to the outside. But this is just to reinforce that he is all about color. So let's turn our attention to his rival, the best known, um, probably the most important artist of the 20th century, without a doubt, the most important artist of the 20th century, Pablo Picasso. He was born into an artistic family, received training from birth, essentially. And as legend has it, his very first word was the Spanish word for pencil. He had a very long and continuously innovative career. I think for most artists, if they have like one hit or introduce one new concept, that's a win for their entire reputation and their entire lives. But, um, but Picasso was somebody who was always innovating. And I think that's why you so often hear the term genius associated with him. Now, his personal life was very different from Matisse, who was uh, rather traditional. We know uh, um, that Picasso was sort of like a serial womanizer, or serial monogamist, and he was a little bit more indulgent, whereas uh, Matisse was, was so disciplined and rigorous. Matisse was interested in color and you have Picasso who's interested in form. So he's the co-founder of a movement called Cubism and we'll be looking at that in just a moment. And um, just as a reminder, he also loved Cezanne. That was his master that he credited. Um, but his, his, um, what he took away from Cezanne was so different from what Matisse did. So let's take a look at um, Picasso's early masterwork the Demoiselle d'Avignon from 1907. This is in the collection of MoMA in New York City. And this is his strikingly modern uh, depiction of, of, of five women, uh, nude women, prostitutes, who are, um, who are sort of deconstructed so that Picasso can explore this notion of, of showing three-dimensionality in a new way, in an innovative way. So you can see their body parts from, from figure to figure are, are deconstructed and, and, um, and painted in sort of radically different styles. And this was also a picture that, that Picasso really struggled with along the way. This was a challenge for him. He's trying to find an innovative new way to express the modern experience. 
Now, in addition to the way it's painted, you have these very unsettling faces on, on these women. Two of them are wearing African masks, so their faces look distorted. And um, two of them are sort of staring out at us blankly. And then there's this, thir this fifth figure whose face sort of seems like a combination of those things. Um, people also hated this, this work when he first exhibited it. Uh, Picasso's own uh, dealer said this is the work of a madman when he saw it. So, um, so Picasso goes on from there uh, to help found this movement of cubism, which is all about um, sort of deconstructing three-dimensional forms to render them on a two-dimensional surface. And this is one of his masterworks, one of my favorite cubist works, which is called Still Life with Chair Caning from 1912. So what he's showing us here is essentially a breakfast table, but he's flattened it all out and he's drained it of color. He's really just trying to suggest these three-dimensional shapes it, um, in the form of cubes. He's also doing something innovative here in that he's doing it with um, with a collage or what the what um, what art historians often refer to as an assemblage. So we have a reproduction of chair caning. Um, you can imagine uh, there's a lot of uh, breakfast tables that have chairs that look like this. So it's just a, a, a printed sheet of paper that he's applied to the surface of his picture here. And then he's painting over it. Um, over here, you might recognize a knife blade and handle. He has cut what looks like a lemon or an orange in half. Uh, maybe there's a coffee cup or a bottle at the center here. And then uh, over here, we have a few letters and a reference to a newspaper, the beginning of the word journal. But in French, J-O-U also means to play. So he's being really playful with his composition here as well. And then instead of having a wooden frame, he has lined the whole thing with a rope. And, and that is, again, a, a really sort of playful and innovative aspect to what he's doing here. So uh, again, people were really astonished by this kind of painting. Uh, and we're going to sort of fast forward through his career, just so I can show you one, um, one more masterwork by P Pablo Picasso from 1937. And this is, of course, his, his picture called Guernica. It's a monumental painting, and it was done in response to the Nazis bombing a small town in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Um, he had read a lot about it in a newspaper. He had see seen um, black and white photos in the newspaper, which sort of inspired him to reduce his palette for this picture down to black, white, gray, and blue. And he focuses his picture on the devastation that that bombing caused. And it, it, as a result, people generally think of this as, an, as, um, as one of the most powerful anti-war statements ever painted. So we have uh, several references to um, the loss of and suffering of women and children, but uh, I, my eye always goes to this figure grouping over here on the right and just the anguish, or sorry, on the left, um, the anguish that this woman is expressing with her dead child in her arms. We have... Um, we have just uh, the, the, this extreme distortion in the faces and bodies of these figures that kind of speak to the horror that they've endured. We have a dead soldier whose face is here, his hands sort of spread, uh, spread out in the foreground. Here he's holding onto a broken sword and he's been dismembered. And then we have this figure over here in the far right who is trapped in a burning building. So without showing us blood, without really show, showing us gore, he is showing us the absolute horror and loss and devastation that this bombing caused. Art historians have spent a lot of time talking about his inclusion of these animals because they also reference, you know, the artist's entire body of work. He's always included, um, well, he's included these animals in, in many of his works along the way. So there's a lot of different interpretations of them. But this is such a powerful work of art that, um, that a copy of, of it was made in tapestry form and it hung at the United Nations in New York City. And actually back in the early 2000s when Colin Powell went to the United Nations to sort of make the case for America invading Iraq, the US actually um, had 
Picasso's copy of, of Guernica that was there taken down because it's such a powerful anti-war statement. And they felt like they couldn't make it with this picture up in, in uh, as a as sort of a backdrop. So that really speaks to its power almost uh, 75 years later or so. All right, so let's get back to Matisse and Picasso as the matchup here. We have Matisse on the left as the colorist, Picasso on the right as the artist interested in shape and form. So very quickly, we have this notion of them having this boxing match, right? We know that Picasso saw Matisse's joy of living and we know that he um, he's sort of quoting it with his masterwork, the Demoiselle d'Avignon. You can see similar poses translating from one picture to the next. Um, even this sort of strange figure over here that almost looks like she's got three legs. We've got the same sort of uh, ambiguous kind of squatting figure whose arm kind of blends into their leg over here. Matisse knows that Picasso is kind of quoting him over here and he is upset about it. He thinks that this is an awful painting and he doesn't want to be associated with it. I mentioned the Stein family before, these patrons of the arts. This is Gertrude Stein in a photograph over here. We see up above her uh, the portrait of Gertrude Stein that Picasso painted in the early 1900s. The Steins played such an important role in Paris as patrons of the arts. They were buying Picasso's work just a few years after he was burning his own drawings to heat his, um, his small home at the time. They were desperate for this patronage. They were for the money. And so the Steins would hold these little salons and, um, and invite artists like Picasso and Matisse to come and see what everybody else was painting. So they were kind of forced to keep company with each other and forced to look at each other's works of art. Uh, the Steins purchased, well, we've got a, a couple of Picassos on the wall over here, but they also purchased this blue nude by Matisse. And, um, and there was an art critic who was there to, for one of these salons and sort of asked Picasso Picasso, what he thought about Matisse's work. And he said, if he wants to make a woman, let him make a woman. If he wants to make a design, let him make a design. This is somewhere between the two. So he was sort of disparaging uh, Matisse along the way. And the artists would sort of um, criticize each other's work along the way. They, they were really um, searching for different solutions, as I mentioned. But Somewhere along the way, this rivalry sort of softens and it goes from a boxing match to a dialogue. The artists actually begin to trade works of art. And then we can see that by the 1930s, their work really seems to be speaking to each other, influenced by each other. We have Matisse over here um, with, a, 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 this is just one section of a mural that's at the Barnes Foundation. It's sort of similar to that dance that we saw before with these, um, really simplified characters kind of interacting with each other, these rounded forms. And then Matisse is using the same rounded forms to create the image of a woman. Um, this is one of his lovers, Maurice Therese. The, the color palette for both of these is reduced down to these simple bars of color. And both of these artists are exploring the female form in new ways. Having said this, even though their work really looks like it's um, sort of in line with each other. At one point, uh, Matisse writes in his notebook that they're going to be exhibited, some of their work is going to be exhibited at an upcoming exhibition in the same room. And he writes, I can imagine the room with my pictures on one side and his pictures on the other. It's as if I'm going to cohabit with an epileptic. <laughs> so he wasn't always that fond of what uh, Picasso was producing. So Matisse goes on to, um, to uh, for this long career of creating what are generally seen as these very pleasant images. And oftentimes he, he emphasizes, or he goes back to the same composition of an interior, oftentimes populated by a beautiful woman who's kind of lost in thought or reading. And then there's usually, in terms of his favorite kind of compositional device, a window at the back of the room that sort of releases you and lets you see a beautiful landscape out the window. The year after Matisse dies, Picasso paints this picture on the right, which is called simply The Studio. 
and there's nobody in it. It's um, and the uh, the absence there seems to emphasize how he feels about um, the the absence of Matisse now. And you'll notice that he also included the window at the back of the room and the release into a beautiful landscape in the back. And he said at the end of his life, um, you have got to be able to picture side by side everything Matisse and I were doing. No one has ever looked at Matisse's painting more carefully than I, and no one has looked at my more carefully than he. So it's hard to say who exactly is considered the victor in this rivalry. I think um, most people are more, probably more familiar with Picasso than Matisse, but I think in the end, a lot of people might prefer Matisse's color over, um, over Picasso's explorations of form. So just to, to wrap up today, we've seen incredible images from some of the world's greatest masters, some of them focusing on, on war and patriotism, or in some cases, anti-war statements. We've seen images of tranquility that were expressed in innovative ways. But in the end, um, I, I hope the, the big takeaway is that we could not have gotten from the Mona Lisa to the woman in the hat without artists really challenging each other and setting up that competitive edge to innovate continually along the way. So I will end there for now and I'll start looking through the questions in the chat. And since we're a fairly intimately sized group, if anybody has a burning question and wants to take themselves off mute, you're welcome to do so. I just wanna say thank you. That was really, that was great. Most of the chat is just, Thank you. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Thank you for these very nice comments. I appreciate them. And I see that Kate asked about the color in harmony and red. Oh, it's so interesting that you asked that, Kate, because we can go back to that really quickly. Um, oh, well, there's there it is again. Um, believe it or not, um, for Matisse and, and harmony and red, he was actually commissioned to paint a blue picture and for some reason landed on red. And, and I think for us, our, our emotional connection to red is usually like power, danger, love, all of these things. And I do think it's a really overwhelming red, but I think once you sit with it for a while, it becomes really warm and inviting and, um, and, and you know, all of these sort of organic uh, shapes that go through it too. There's something almost like visceral about it, but in, in, in a good way. So I think that it was intended to be a, a warm sort of welcoming red in that, in that case, even though I think at first glance, it has a very jarring effect, but that's just my hunch. <laughs> but it is interesting that he was designed, he was commissioned to create something blue. Oh, I really appreciate all of the nice comments. Thank you, everybody. And um, I do, as I mentioned before, I do this for a living. So if you're interested in ever um, checking out one of my other programs, my website is IamCulturallyCurious.com. I work with a lot of great libraries that offer these kinds of programs for free. So there is a calendar on my website and you can see what else is upcoming too. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have you back. Um, oh, I would love that. Yeah. We'll, um, we run this Monday morning series um, in the fall and the spring. And I know you have many different topics. Yeah. Yep. So. Well, this, I think that this is such a great way to start the day. I mean, we've spent it with like some of the greatest artists the world has ever known. And I always feel like that is like a palate cleanser for the mind and the soul. So now we can all go off and do great things today. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? No, it just looks. I'm just checking for raised hands. No, I think we're good. Um, and you caught up on all the wonderful presentation comments. That's okay. Really nice. Oh, okay. I see Gary has raised. Oh, oh yeah. Great. Hi, I, uh, hi I, I loved your presentation. I put some comments in the chat. Uh, did you say that you have a website because I, I think yes. I missed that. Yep. Uh, it's right here on the screen. It's I am culturally curious.com. Okay. Thank you. I'll look, 
I'll look you up. I am culturallycurious.com. Okay. Hope we see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barry. All right. And somebody said, is it true Michelangelo's dad had a marble quarry? Um, Kate, the, the, I think the legend that I've heard around this is that, um, is that he, if I'm remembering this correctly, forgive me if I'm not, is that essentially he, um, he was like partially raised by, um, I, hold on, I'm, I'm like second guessing myself. I'm, I'm wondering if I'm mixing up legends right now, but he, he was raised essentially by a, a, a nurse who, who, um, who was married to somebody who owned a quarry. So there was like this notion that he, he like got this instinct for sculpting like through, um, through his nurse's milk. Um, but I might, this might be apocryphal. So I'm not entirely sure about that story. I don't, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm not sure if it was his father. I think it, it might've been sort of like an early teacher kind of thing. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank My you. My pleasure. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah. Take care. Have a good day, everyone.